Hello folks, Bananiac here. Today I have a very special guest for you all. The author of numerous best-selling books such as The Starch Solution and is a medical doctor and has studied the effects of nutrition on disease for well over 30 years, Dr. John McDougall. Thank you for joining us today. Thank, thank you. Good to be here. Hope I can help get some good words out to your listeners. Absolutely. And now, why don't you just start off um, by telling us a little bit about your story and how you got into the field sure. of medicine and why you advocate what you do today? Well, I've been doing this for uh, about 45 years. And uh, I'm a medical doctor. I'm a board certified internist. I'm licensed in four states. I'm just a regular doctor. I practice standard medicine. I'm not holistic. I'm not alternative medicine. I'm just a standard old medical family type general doctor. The difference is, is I don't treat dietary diseases with drugs. You know, I fix the diet. Uh, I discovered this. Uh, my great fortune was when I was a young man in my uh, mid 20s. I finished medical school, did an internship in Honolulu, Hawaii, and then after that, I took a job for three years as a family practitioner on uh, the Big Island of Hawaii. And uh, there on a sugar plantation where I worked, I learned basically everything I know today in three years. Uh, one thing I learned was my limitations as a doctor. My patients did terrible, just like the patients of all doctors do when I treated chronic diseases like chronic high blood pressure, chronic diabetes, chronic obesity, indigestion, heart disease, and so on. The patients never get better. They didn't get better 40 uh, years ago, and uh, they don't get better today because the tools we have, plain and simple, don't work and never will work. <clears throat> so I had to realize that during those three years that I was a highly ineffective physician. And, of course, I took it very personal. Uh, the other thing that I learned was that... Uh, uh, what I believed to be a good diet, which was a well-balanced diet, the one I was raised on, was actually very destructive. It was, uh, the, it is, was then, and still is the core of the problems of the Western world today, a well-balanced diet with meat and dairy. I learned this from my patients, from my uh, uh, first, second, third, and fourth generation Filipino, Japanese, Chinese, and Korean patients who were the workers on the sugar plantation the first generation that was raised in a native land, such as the Philippines, learned a diet of rice and vegetables. After you learn something as a child, you keep that the rest of your life. And so they moved to the Big Island to start new families and new jobs and on the sugar plantation. They kept their diet. And these first generation patients, they remain trim, healthy, hearty into their 80s and 90s, young looking, avoiding heart disease, multiple sclerosis, constipation, type 2 diabetes, I mean 100% of the time they avoided these conditions. Their kids who were raised you know, on the Big Island, Hawaii, were more influenced by Western eating. They gave up more of their traditional diet of rice and vegetables and incorporated more of the well-balanced American diet. And they got fatter and sicker, and by the time you got to the third generation, they were fully Westernized. They were fat and sick, just like people of any of any racial background, of any uh, country. They were fat and sick. They were Americans. So right then and there, and that was about um, all, that was about 1976, I realized that what I was taught about good eating was flawed information. And then I quit the plantation after three years knowing that I was not a good doctor and uh, knowing that what I'd been taught about nutrition was not correct. And I went back into internal medicine residency training where I tried to become a good doctor and I found out that uh, there was no hope because you cannot treat dietary diseases with medications. you got to fix the diet. So since that time, which has been 1978, I have uh, spent my, my life uh, trying to communicate to people what the problem is, and that is that the food is making them sick. We're suffering from food, food poisoning, basically. Uh, it just happens to be uh, rich foods that poison the arteries and the cells and so on. And the way to get well is very simple. You just eat like uh, almost everybody who's walked the planet of the earth has eaten, and that is starch-based diets. Uh, you need to live on rice. That needs to be your central focus of calories. It can be rice or potatoes or sweet potatoes or wheat. You know, there are many, many starches you can choose, but this is key to people succeeding is to understand they must get their calories from starch. There are a lot of people out there trying to get healthy, they're uh, going vegetarian and getting into these fake soy foods, and they're failing. 
There are people out there that are trying to become vegan and they're getting into green and yellow vegetables like broccoli, cauliflower, and uh, kale and spinach, and they're failing because they're starving to death. Uh, key to getting your health fixed and having everything work as it should, including being satisfied with your diet, is to understand that the human diet is cooked starch. I mean, that's what people have been eating uh, for probably a million years. And certainly I can document that kind of eating to uh, over 100,000 years ago is uh, people have been eating cooked starch as the primary source of their calorie intake. Doesn't mean they were vegans or vegetarian. They certainly weren't. But animal foods were a luxury uh, for most people most of the time. Now, there are some people who got to eat animal foods a lot uh, in various hunter-gatherer populations. And the uh, evidence of this eating is seen when you examine their bodies. Uh, these hunter-gatherers can have uh, atherosclerosis in their arteries. And it's from eating meat. That's why they get it. And better documentation of the effects of that kind of eating come from the Egyptians, from the mummies of old, from 3,500 years ago. When you look at their mummified bodies, you'll find extensive atherosclerosis in these mummies. These mummies were the priests and priestess, the pharaohs, the kings, the queens. They're the people who got to eat the meat. So this kind of eating, meat eating, animal food eating, has, uh, has damaged the body for thousands of years. This is nothing new. The only thing new is the number of people who can eat like kings and queens. Uh, that's all that's changed. I mean, back in olden times, uh, most people had to eat rice, corn, barley, beans. That was their food. That's all they could afford. And they maybe had meat once or twice a year at most or a small amount on a weekly or daily basis, very small amount. The kings and queens of old, they had all the money. They were rich. And as a consequence, they could eat like, like Americans. Yeah. Like Americans do today. And of course, you know, just like the kings and queens ate like Americans, they got fat and sick. Well, if Americans eat like kings and queens, what would you expect? Yeah. They get fat and sick. That's why people are sick in our society. It's very simple to understand. And once you understand it, if you choose to do so, it's very simple to fix. You just stop eating like a king and a queen. What you do, instead of getting your primary source of calories from meat and dairy and oil, and other junk food, and I do classify meat and dairy and poultry and things like that as junk food. I mean, they're not the right food for people. What you do is you change your primary source of calories from animal foods and oils, free oils like olive oil, canola oil, etc. You change your primary source of calories to starch, like rice, corn, potatoes, beans, peas, lentils. And then you add fruits and vegetables. Uh, they're called uh, perishable Green and yellow vegetables are primarily perishable. They're like broccoli and cauliflower and kale and lettuce. Those are fine side dishes, and they should be in your diet. They don't have to be, but they should be in your diet. And you also eat some fruits. And then if you do eat rich foods, maybe you have a piece of cake on your birthday, or maybe you have a piece of turkey on Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. but you can't have every day being a day filled with holidays. In America, we start out every morning with Easter, and then we go on to Thanksgiving and Christmas for lunch and dinner. Every night after dinner, we have a birthday party. Yeah. That's why people are sick. Uh, and as a result of that kind of sickness, we have the pharmaceutical industry stepping in, the medical doctors and the hospitals stepping in and trying to solve these dietary diseases with drugs. And it's an abysmal failure. It is, uh, it's is—it's just a, a horrible thing that's happening to people, uh, to our uh, country, to the world, uh, to have this kind of devastation of illness which is very costly, leads to very non-productive people uh, having this widespread. In fact, it's universal. I mean, basically everybody in the United States is sick. Uh, they're sick. Two-thirds of the people, they say, are overweight. Two-thirds or more are overweight. A third are obese. They expect 44% uh, to be obese, not just overweight, but obese very shortly. Uh, at least half the people uh, will die of heart disease or related cardiovascular diseases. Uh, diabetes is uh, now about 10% of the population. It's predicted to be 30% or more soon. I mean, everybody's sick. They're on medications. They have high risk factors like high blood pressure, high cholesterol. They're sick. And the, the thing is, is the cause is absolutely obvious. The solution is cost-free, side effect-free, simple within anybody's reach. You don't have to be a medical doctor or dietitian to figure this out and do this. All you must do is switch 
the bulk of your calories from meat and dairy, which is called saturated fat and cholesterol, to starch, which is called carbohydrate or complex carbohydrate. But I would rather you not get, in, get into these medical dietetic terms. Don't, you don't talk carbohydrate, fat, cholesterol, et cetera. You should talk meat and dairy because that's the problem. That's what yeah. you see on your plate. And you should talk starch, which is the solution. And starch used to be, it still is the correct terminology. It used to be a very acceptable word. But since 1977, it has become an unacceptable word and associated with, with unhealthy things. But that's not true. Starch is the diet of people, always has been the diet of people, always will be the diet of people. And once you understand this and put rice, corn, potatoes, sweet potatoes back into your diet as the center of your diet, the bulk of your calories, You'll lose the weight, the bowels will start working, the indigestion goes away, your blood pressure comes down, your cholesterol goes, comes down. And how often does it do that? Virtually 100% of the time. This is as close as a half a bottle of whiskey and a hangover. You would expect a hardcore drunk that quit alcohol would get well. And they do, always. You would expect a cigarette smoker to stop coughing and wheezing if they quit cigarettes. How often? Always. And you would expect somebody nourished, poorly nourished, malnourished by the Western diet of meat, dairy, oils, and other junk, when you switch them to a starch-based diet, they get better always. Now, can you reverse all lung damage when you still quit, quit smoking? No. I mean, there's some residual damage, some scars and cancers left. Likewise, you can't reverse all damage by fixing the diet, especially later in life. But what you do accomplish is, is nothing short of a miracle. It is cough-free, side-effect-free. It always works. It's good for the planet. The animals are really happy when you do this because they're tired of getting uh, abused and slaughtered. I mean, everybody's a winner except for the drug industries, the hospitals, the hospitals. I mean, look at your community. You've got a new hospital right down the block. You've got a new cancer center in your city. You've got a new heart disease center in your city. That's where the money is. That's the only growing segment of our economy in the United States is the healthcare industry. And it's based on sick people who are sick because of the food. The solution is simple. We could take and wipe out these cancer centers, these heart disease centers, cut your hospitals probably by, probably by a fifth of the number of hospitals you have if the American population would understand this and implement it and just change their food. I mean, just start out in the morning with uh, oatmeal or pancakes or waffles. Uh, go on for lunch and dinner to uh, <clears throat> to healthy uh, bean-based uh, burgers or uh, rice and vegetables. One of our favorite dishes is uh, rice bowls. In fact, it'll be in this next newsletter. Uh, these are uh, uh, burrito bowls, I think they're calling them. What they do is they put in a bowl. You take bowl, you put rice in it. Whole grain rice, of course, is better. You put in your favorite beans. You put in some kale and a few other uh, fruits and vegetables like tomatoes and so on and a little of your favorite hot sauce on it, and that's one of our favorite meals, and that's all you do. Absolutely, and I hold your advice to the highest regard, sir. Um, you know, I, I watched Forks Over Knives. I heard, you know, what this diet can actually do, even reverse some of the most major diseases, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, sure. that we have in it's this easy, country. It's easy, and it should be expected, and the science is clear. This does work. There is no argument as to the truth. Uh, the argument is, uh, is one as to whether people will implement the truth. There are a lot of reasons people don't, and primarily it's financial. If we could change the financial motivation of doctors and industry, we'd have this solved tomorrow. I mean, if sickness, sickness uh, costs people, or if they, it does, but if they realized it costs them their, their money, then they would change. I mean, this is costing us big time, this kind of sickness. Uh, for example, in industry, I've been doing a lot of shows lately about industry. Uh, industry in our country has a hard time competing because uh, they employ sick people. Uh, they don't uh, they don't function as well when they're fat and sick and worried about their constipation and indigestion rather than their job, which is what happens. And the other thing is, is for these sick people, you have to dedicate money for their health care, both current sick people, current employees, and retirees. For example. General Motors has to add $1,500 to each automobile that it makes just to cover the health care needs of current and former employees. 
you see, and they have to compete with uh, Toyota of Japan, which doesn't have those expenses. Don't They have more productive workers because they're healthy because they live on a starch-based diet. Now, I realize the Japanese diet is changing. We're leveling the playing field by sending McDonald's and Burger King to Tokyo. But it's going to take a long time before these two uh, workforces equalize. As it is now, our sick workforce cannot compete with the workforce of, say, an Asian country where the bulk of the calories still come from rice or other starches. Absolutely. And um, it's amazing. Even uh, I think last week or the week before, Kaiser Permanente, one of the biggest health organizations, published an article saying all doctors should recommend uh, a whole food plant-based diet to their patients. Yeah, that's moving forward. This is one of the few <clears throat> medical insurance organizations that clearly benefits from better health of its clients. Um, you know, uh, that uh, Kaiser is a uh, health maintenance organization that receives its money from, uh, from clients, and if it has to pay money out, like in terms of heart surgery, then what happens is the balance sheet is not in its favor. So these discussions are going on at Kaiser now. My son, who's a medical doctor at Kaiser, he's an internist at Kaiser in Portland, is very much involved in these discussions as to how Kaiser should move forward and implement a healing program rather than treatment programs. And it was what was mentioned in one of the casual meetings that they had <clears throat> is the cost of one heart surgery, if it goes well, uh, is enough money spent to hire one physician for a year to treat a health patients with a healthy diet. If the heart surgery goes poorly, you could probably hire 10 physicians at Kaiser for a year or one physician for 10 years to treat people with a healthy diet. So the economics are there for Kaiser. Uh, the problems are that Kaiser is staffed by people who still eat the rich Western diet. They can't see beyond their dinner plates. They're staffed by traditional physicians who are afraid to act. They're afraid to do the right thing. They're afraid to, that they'll be criticized by their colleagues and they're afraid that they will be sued even by doing the right thing. So they just keep doing the wrong thing because everybody does the wrong thing and there's comfort in uh, you know, being part of the mass. Sure. But Kaiser, Kaiser is changing. <clears throat> so it's, it's exciting times. I mean, this is, this is the time, it is our time to change the world. Absolutely. It just takes people like yourself and your listeners <clears throat> to act on the truth. The truth is clear what we need to do is clear we can either do it voluntarily, which I hope we do, or we will do it because we have to, because the world is changing with uh, climate change, with the growing populations of people, uh, with all kinds of things that are predicted for the future. You will be eating a starch-based diet, or you may be eating nothing in the future. <laughs> so we have a opportunity to act, to control our future, or we can let our future control us. And, you know, I, I, the more we get this information out, the faster we do, the better future we will have. And, uh, you know, that's what everybody has to realize. This is more than whether or not you have a bowel movement. This has to do whether or not your children and grandchildren children, or you have a future. Absolutely. So it's time to act. It's time to stand up and to say what is true and to stop the people who are lying and misrepresenting the science there. And I will specifically name the paleo people and the other low-carb diet gurus. These people are not telling the truth. They are no. purposely misrepresenting the science, and the public is paying the price. So, hey, read the literature, look at the issues, and stand up to these liars. I think that's spelled uh, L-I-A-R-S. Yeah. Anyway, do it. The world counts on you. Yeah, absolutely. And um, now that we are on that subject, Dr. McDougal, every, you know, I tell people about all the benefits of going plant-based, eating lots of starch, you yeah. know, um, and this is so silly, but the only thing they can say back to me is, isn't that too many carbohydrates? Will I get fat on carbohydrates? So if you can just kind of clear this topic yeah, for... Sure. This is very simple. <clears throat> when somebody says, don't eat starch or carbohydrates or rice, that's another, you know, that's yeah. a starch, <clears throat> say, yeah, you're right. Or, or, yeah, let's think about this. Let's see. Don't eat starch, like don't eat rice, because rice turns to sugar, which turns to fat, and that's why there are 1.73 billion obese Asians living on rice-based diets. <laughs> and then everybody stops and says, 
Well, that's not true. Then start the conversation. Of course, rice and starch and carbohydrates don't make you fat. Right. I mean, there are no fat people ever currently on planet Earth or at any time in history who've lived on starch-based diets. There's no such thing. Yeah. You can look at the Mayans and the Aztecs, whose civilization lasted eight to 1,300 years. These were mighty, strong warrior people. <clears throat> they were known as the people of the corn. They lived on corn. The Incas, who had a powerful civilization, <clears throat> lived on potatoes until they went to battle, and then they switched to quinoa. The people in the Middle East, even today, you turn on TV and you watch stories about Iraq, Iran, Syria, Libya, Egypt, and you watch the masses of people. 71% of their diet is still carbohydrate. These are trim, healthy, strong people that you ought to fear. You should fear them in the sense that they are stronger and healthier than American people are. And if there was ever a contest, if it had to do with physical strength and endurance, we would be in big trouble because we have such poor health. Our military is fat and sick, and that's unacceptable. That's unacceptable and uncivilized for us to do this. So you can see the Middle East, the breadbasket of the world, the effects of high carbohydrate diets. There's no fat people there until they become the prince or the king. You know, then they get fat. No mystery. Absolutely. <clears throat> so you can you can you can repeat this example over and over currently uh, throughout the world or throughout all times in history. And um, what would you say back to those people? It's usually the paleo people that say we should eat like our ancestors, putting focus on the hunter and not the gathering part. Uh, they're either ignorant or liars. Absolutely. One or the other. There's, yeah. all, there's no in-between ground. They're either ignorant or they're lying <laughs> because the research says the opposite. Yeah. The research, I just gave you some current research, but we can go back to uh, 44,000 years ago and look at the Neanderthals. The Neanderthals, uh, their skeletons have been examined uh, all throughout Europe, and what you find is starch granules in between their teeth. These were starch, even Neanderthals, which are supposed to be the meanest, baddest hunter of the hunter gatherers ever were. They were starch eaters. You can look at uh, paleo people from three different areas of Western Europe, and what you'll find, this was from 30,000 years ago, you'll find starch was a, a, the primary source of calories. Uh, you can go back 105,000 years ago to Mozambique in eastern Africa, and you can see evidence of starch eating. Uh, it's just they're just plain and simple lying about the research, and now they are lying. I know they're lying. Are they lying? Well, I don't know what they're doing right now because not only myself but many other respected anthropologists, uh, evolutionary, biologic anthropologists have stood up and said, "You guys got it wrong." You're absolutely wrong, and the research is absolutely clear that they're wrong. So if they're still telling that story, there's only two choices. Uh, you know, their, their eyes and ears are closed, their brain is numb, maybe from eating all that meat, or they're lying. You know, there's nothing in between, folks. Yeah, and if we want to keep people trim and healthy and lacing up and getting out there playing sports, you know, you're not going to do that on meat and dairy. You're going to do it on carbohydrates. Right. All long-distance winners eat a high-carbohydrate diet. They call it carbohydrate loading. But yeah, long-distance runners, uh, bicyclists, they live on high-carb diets. That's where you get your endurance. The winners do. The losers, you know, they can eat anything they want. But the winners always eat high-carb diets. Starch, it's starch-based. <clears throat> I want to get away from that term carbohydrate because that confuses people. It's just like the dairy and the meat industry. They purposefully... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, demand that government policies like uh, the, like the uh, dietary guidelines for Americans that are published every five years, they uh, require <clears throat> that these documents, when they talk about the harmful effects of food, do not talk about dairy and meat. Instead, they say saturated fat. Yeah. And the public doesn't know what saturated fat is. Saturated fat is meat, dairy, and eggs. But they won't let them use those words because it might cause Americans to take action. So stop talking about saturated fat and cholesterol. Start talking about meat, dairy, and eggs. Stop talking about carbohydrate and complex carbohydrate. You wouldn't be able to find a carbohydrate, but you could sure find a potato, and you could sure find rice. Uh, you can sure find starch. 
So we have to change our terminology back to practical terms so the public has a chance to act. And so every time you say carbohydrate, I'll probably uh, introduce that correction not to be unkind, but because we must start focusing on our minds uh, with words that allow us to take action. And right now the words have prevented action from being taken because they're, uh, they're not relevant. They're not, uh, they're not practical. Uh, you never eat a fat carb or a carbohydrate, or you do, but you, you, you not in, in that kind of terminology. You can't grow these things in your garden, but you can grow potatoes, rice, corn, etc. And so we need to get that kind of verbiage back into the into the public discussions. And now it is a starch-based diet. Most of your calories coming from starch. Yeah. How about um, folks like myself and my viewers who want to go completely plant-based? Yeah. Do you think it can be done if you still get your whole calories from starches? Um, do you think it can be done properly without any meat or dairy in the diet? Adding meat and dairy adds nothing that you can't get better from plants except for B12, yep. which, is, which is the only discussion you need to have. You can't miss. The foods were designed complete. People yeah. can live on potatoes and water alone. Yeah. They've done it for periods of time as long as a year and a half and published in the scientific literature. I mean, you know, basically all their calories came from potatoes, or you can do it with sweet potatoes. Uh, the foods are complete. When it comes to underground storage organs, which are your roots and bulbs and corms like potatoes and sweet potatoes, they have all the vitamins and minerals that you would possibly need. Above ground storage organs, where they store energy, carbohydrate, are called seeds. Uh, they are legumes and grains. Uh, beans, peas, lentils, rice, corn, wheat, those kinds of things. Above ground storage organs, you have to add a source of A and C. And so if you have a, you know, a slice of orange or a flower out of broccoli a day with your rice, you'll get right. all everything you need except B12, which is a subject where you, that you might or might not want to get into. It doesn't make any difference. It's probably not worth the trouble discussing. But I yep. just add a little bit of uh, B12 to the diet as a supplement, and that takes care of everything. So in answer to your question, let, let's, let me go into it more specifically. Sure. Uh, what has happened in industry, all industry, uh, is they use a marketing tool called unique positioning. Okay. Unique positioning, what a company does, uh, say, say an automobile company these days, what they'll do is they'll tell you, our car gets 52 miles per gallon, so you ought to buy it. You know, it's really a cool car. And, but they don't tell you that a car built that lightly if you get in an auto accident, you're likely to be killed. They don't advertise that part of their product. It's the same thing with uh, the food industry. What they do is they advertise something that's specific about their product. It's called unique positioning. And so, for example, what unique positioning has done over the last uh, 60, 80 years is it has caused people to reflexly answer these questions. When I say calcium, you say Dairy. <laughs> when I say protein, you say meat. And when I say omega-3 fat, you say fish. Okay. <laughs> That's unique positioning. Even though yeah. there is no such thing, you cannot find me any cases of protein, calcium, or omega-3 fatty acid deficiency in the world literature yeah. of any people or population that's lived on any reasonable natural diet. And that includes a pure vegan starch-based diet. There is no such thing as protein, calcium, or omega-3 fatty acid deficiency. No such thing. And yet, uh, major food industries are built upon unique positioning, which are advertising nutrients that they have a lot of in their product. There's no denying that, but are unnecessary. In fact, yeah. when you buy those particular products, you take in things that have been proven beyond anybody's doubt to kill you, to make you sick and fat. There's no question that meat, dairy, and eggs will give you heart attacks and strokes and type 2 diabetes and cancer. There's the literature, I could fill a huge library spanning many city blocks with the science that shows that. But you can't find me any papers, any research, any studies that show protein, calcium, or omega-3 fatty acid deficiency based on any natural diet, including a starch-based diet, with no animal foods, no fish, no meat, no eggs, nothing. You cannot find me a, si a single study. Yeah. So it's one of the biggest lies that, lies that has ever been uh, perpetrated on the medical doctors, the scientific community, and the public 
and somehow, somehow nobody has the interest to stand up and to say what I just told you, is there is no such thing as deficiency diseases from the lack of these nutrients by not getting meat, dairy, and fish. Well, it's amazing. We really have to do something about it and get it out there to the general public. Well, I need your help. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've, been, I've been beating the drums for uh, almost 38 years now, and I'm not tired. <laughs> don't, don't you think that? I'm not tired. Uh, I'm going to be out there for the next 20 years, but I can't do this alone. Yeah. You know, other dietitians and uh, doctors and interested public, you know, when people tell you things like, don't eat rice, it turns to sugar, makes you fat, get in their face. Yeah. Or if you don't get in their face, that's not your style, just stand back and, you know, kind of flex your muscles and, you know, <laughs> expose some of your body parts and say, hey, look what it does to me. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> working for me, whatever you want, working for me. I live on starch, look at me, and look at you. In fact, I feel so strongly about that that I made a video, <clears throat> which you might want to show to your listeners. Sure. Right? This is a two-minute, 17-second video, which I would encourage you to put up on your site. Sure. I got so frustrated with the fact that there are articulate gurus who have their science, even though it's flawed, and I know it's flawed, and I know they're lying about it. The public doesn't know that. You know, the public sits there and says, well, you know, here's a guy recommending you eat meat and fish and dairy and uh, low carbs, stay away from rice, corn, potatoes. Yeah. And he's got his science. Yep. And here you are, McDougal, and your guys, you're recommending just the opposite. Who am I supposed to believe? So what I did, uh, along with some help of my good friends, as I produced a video about a year and a half ago, it's called Low Carb Versus Plant Based. Okay. And what it is is about, it's, it is uh, videos short videos and still pictures of the people who make these recommendations. <laughs> so you will take in the first scene, you will see the uh, father of the paleo diet, Lauren Cordain, obese, obese, looking sick. That's what the paleo guy looks. In the second frame, I believe, is Sally Fallon from Western Price Foundation, oh who <laughs> is a meat promoter. Fat, yeah. obviously fat. Then you go on to people like uh, Barry Sears and Robert Atkins and William Davis, the new wheat belly guy. These people are all fat, and they look sick to me. Yeah. And then you take a look at our camp, like uh, Neil Bernard and uh, Caldwell Esselstyn yeah. and uh, a Pam Popper and so on. Yeah. And yeah. what you see is we're trim, hearty, young-looking. Open your eyes, folks. Yeah. Open your eyes. I mean, look at what the gurus look like who are recommending particular diets it should be clear to you these people are fat and sick i believe they're following their own diet our camp is trim and healthy i know we're following our diet you choose it's like you come, choose to us. To come to us <laughs> put that up on your website yeah absolutely your, it's called, it's just go to youtube and type in low carb versus plant or plant food or plant based and it should come right up otherwise it's on my website which is okay. drmcdougal.com and you'll find it if you look through uh, my recommended free videos. Okay, great. Yeah, I'll definitely check that out. Um, I have one last question for you, Dr. McDougall, and this is kind of going a little bit towards a different direction. There's a big, there's big attention in the fruitarian community okay. and the 80-10-10, um, and what they advocate is a raw fruit and vegetable diet. And I, you know, personally, I enjoy eating a ton of fruit and uh, banana sure. smoothies. Um, but I was wondering if uh, I could get your thoughts on if right. this is a healthy... Oh, certainly it's better than the American diet. Yeah. I, you know, certainly it's an R10 trend toward, uh, toward a better diet. Uh, and certainly people like this because fruit tastes good because it's full of sugar. Sure. And when you, when you blend something, when you grind it up, you release the simple sugar so it tastes good. I mean, carrot juice tastes better than carrots. Yeah. Uh, but this is not the human diet. Now, you'll live on it. You'll live on more successfully than, <clears throat> than you would on the Western diet for sure. Uh, the human diet is a starch-based diet. It always has been, always will be. You'll find me no populations of people throughout all of human history that lived on a raw, raw diet or a fruit diet. I mean, Steve Jobs was a fruitarian for a short period of time. Yeah. Now, I, otherwise, you can find me some isolated people who are brave enough and strong enough to live on fruit and fruit alone. The problem with fruit is it's simple sugars. It's uh, short acting in terms of satisfaction of hunger drive. It just it just doesn't cut it. And plus, fruits are only available 
during a short season of the year. So if you're going to be a fruitarian in any time of history, what are you going to do in the winter? What are you going to do in the spring? You're dead meat. You know, that never happened. Whereas starches are available all year long. A starches store easily. You can store potatoes for, you freeze dry them, which they did naturally uh, 10,000 years ago even. You can store freeze dry potatoes for 10 years. You can take uh, your rice and your corn and your beans and you can put them in a cool, dry place. It'll last for years. So winter comes, you've got food. We are human beings. We have evolved above the lesser primates because of our ability to digest starch. Gorillas and chimpanzees eat fruitarian diets yeah. with perishable vegetables. Yeah. You know, we are we are greater primates in, in a sense. Whatever, I don't want to get into any arguments, but yeah, we yeah. Uh, have evolved from chimpanzees and apes. And the key to that e- evolution has to has been that we were able to tap into a high energy source that was reliable all year long yeah. throughout the entire world, and that's starch. So, so hopefully, hopefully your, your folks who are fruitarians and uh, follow uh, raw foods diets uh, will do it only temporarily. As I say, it's not the worst thing in the world, but it's not a practical thing in terms of large numbers of people, in terms of sustainability, in terms of the best health you will get. You must center your diet around starch, rice, corn, potatoes, as people always have, always have, always will. It's the human diet. You add some fruits and vegetables. Uh, you know, you can vary the amount here and there. If you want to eat animal foods, you know, they're not, they're not healthy. If you want to have candy bars on Halloween, fine. That's Halloween. Mm-hmm. Uh, you want to have a piece of cake on your birthday, you'll, you'll survive it. But you can't do these things every day, all day long, which is yeah. what Americans do. Turkey yep. on Thanksgiving, that may be your choice. But you cannot have Thanksgiving every lunch and dinner. Yeah. Uh, and if you want your health back, and the other thing is, is, is I have to point out one more thing to your listeners. Sure. <clears throat> it's, it's much easier to do things 100%. Yeah. And yeah, so when I say you can have these things, if you're struggling to get your health in order, you can't have these things in the house. Uh, I can't have chocolate candy bars in my uh, pantry <laughs> because I know what will happen to them. Yeah. Uh, so they just aren't brought in the house, uh, even though they're soy-based, all right, the candy right. bars. You know, I, mean, yeah. I, I can't have these things in the house. So if you're really serious about change, you know, set your environment up for success and decide you're just not going to do that. This is what I do. This is what I don't do. Don't give yourself uh, permission because once you give yourself permission, well, I'll just have a little bit of a little bit becomes a lot and you're back to where you were before. So in terms of practical dietary change, anybody who's very serious, I would encourage you to be religious about it, uh, at least while you're getting started until you get your problem solved. It's not that a little bit will kill you. It's just that a little bit will take you off track. It's yeah. like a, a little bit of heroin for a heroin yeah. addict or a little alcohol for an alcoholic right. or you know a couple of cigarettes for a tobacco addict. It never works. Right. And likewise, if you decide, well, I'll have a little of this and a little of that, you're probably in trouble. You're probably not going to solve it. Whereas if you take determination, you say, what I'm going to do is eat a diet like Dr. McDougal recommends. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to say something here, and this may be a good way to close our, close our interview. Sure, sure. The, the, truth, the truth is simple and easy to understand. Any place you look in the world or throughout history, the truth is easy to under, uh, simple and easy to understand. The McDougal diet is a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables. That's one sentence. Sentence number two, the McDougal diet does not contain animal foods or pure oils, free oils like olive oil, yeah. etc. That's it. Two sentences. Yep. Simple, easy to understand. I believe it's the truth. Yeah, and I agree with you, doctor. Um, now, how can people um, find out more about your work and, and get connected? We have, <clears throat> we have an extensive, I have multiple books that I've written. We have uh, uh, dozens of free videos that you can watch on YouTube. You can uh, get to all of this by going to my website, which is drmcdougall.com, spelled D-R-M-C-D-O-U-G-A-L-L.com. And one of the things you'll be struck by when you go to the website is almost everything's free. We have a free 12-day program. All the articles that I've written on heart disease and B12 and, you know, pretty much any other subject you want. I probably have a couple hundred free articles there that are are very extensive and uh, will answer pretty much all your questions about protein and calcium and so on. All those are free on the website. Uh, My wife, Mary, has uh, about 400 recipes published on the website free. 
So everything you need there is free. I, I assure you, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. Everything you need is free. Now, you can go on and purchase our books. You can come to my 10-day living program in Santa Rosa, and I'll lock you up and make you do this, and you will pay for that, and I will be your doctor. I'm a regular practicing medical doctor. So there are things that you can buy. You can come to our Costa Rica trip, which we're, we do twice or once or twice a year, uh, but you will be charged for that. That's not free. Uh, and so there are, there are uh, paid opportunities. Uh, certainly I am in business, but one of the things that, uh, <clears throat> that we have decided to do and decided it many years ago is that uh, money will never be an obstacle for you to do this. Everything you need to know in excess is free on my website at drmcdougall.com. Okay. Well, thank you so much for um, doing this interview today with me, Dr. McDougall. A real honor, and I hope to talk to you again sometime in the future. Well, uh, good. I hope you can put this up on YouTube. Absolutely. And that, uh, maybe we'll even link it to our site. Thank you so much, uh, and it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Alright guys, hope you enjoyed that interview. Dr. McDougall is seriously one of my biggest heroes and influences on why I changed my diet, so I really recommend looking into his work if you haven't already. Also, if you haven't read The Star Solution, make sure to pick it up. Seriously, one of the most eye-opening and inspiring books of all time. It's filled with clinical evidence on how a starch-based diet can help the health of the people, the animals, and the planet. And it's also filled with awesome recipes you guys can even try at home. So if it wasn't for this book, I honestly, I would not be where I am today. So thank you, Dr. John McDougal, for writing this awesome book. So thanks again for watching this awesome interview. I'll have all of Dr. John McDougal's connections down below in the description. Also, be sure to check out The Bananiac on Facebook and Twitter. So don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And let me know what your thoughts were of the interview down below. And I'll see you guys soon. Peace.